Thank you so much for coming out to church in the in-between weekend. How many of you had to ask somebody somewhere in your life this week, what day is it? How many of you have to ask someone, oh, is it, is it church tomorrow? How many of you had to ask someone yet? Yeah, that was me yesterday. Is it, is it church tomorrow? And I'm the pastor. I got lost track of time. See, this is like an odd weekend, isn't it? Like, it's the weekend between Christmas and New Year's. And in, the, in this weekend particularly, it's actually the weekend between one year and the next, but also one decade and the next. And if you anything like me, we spend this time of the year reflecting on the year that was, or in our case, the 10 years that has been, and we start to look forward into all that God has for us in the road ahead. But I want to submit to you tonight that how we reflect about the past will actually determine how we project into the future. How we assess whether God has been with us or not in the year that's gone or the decade that's gone will actually frame our expectations on whether we think God will be with us in the road ahead. And so it's really important for us how we manage transitionary windows, windows where we look back in order to look forwards. I want to take you tonight to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk in the Old Testament was a prophet. In other words, he spoke the mind of God, but he was also a Levite. In other words, a worshiper. So the three chapters in the book of Habakkuk were a mixture of written prophecy as well as songs, songs that were submitted to, I guess, uh, 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 musicians and singers to add melody and rhythm and rhyme so they could be sung congregationally. Habakkuk was ministering at a time around 586 BC where the Babylonian Empire had risen and they had conquered Israel. So the nation of Israel was under great oppression because the Babylonian Empire was very evil. And towards the end of Habakkuk's time, he reflected on the season of difficulty and trial and challenge and oppression that his nation was under, but begins to rightly manage that transitionary window in order to speak life and hope into all that Israel's future will be. And so today, we're going to use Habakkuk as a case study for how we ought to look at the year or the decade that's just gone in order for us to position ourselves for all that God has for us in the coming decade. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to honor the, the Bible tonight, Habakkuk chapter 3. Media team, you're just going to have to keep up with me because I'm going to talk hard and fast. I'm running out of time. Habakkuk 3 verse 17. He writes this, Though the fig tree does not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive fails, and the fields produce no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there are no cattle in the stalls. It sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? Habakkuk then says this, Yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. The Lord is, present tense, my strength, my source of courage, my invincible army. He has made my feet steady and sure like hind's feet, brackets of a deer, and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence on my high places of challenge and responsibility. And you can lodge this to the choir director. This prayer is to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Let's give God a big shout of praise. <laughs> Grab your seat. Tonight, I want to speak to you on this final Sunday of the year on the thought, what song are you singing? What song are you singing? Whether you realize it or not, at any given time in your life, any particular season in your life, there is a song in your heart. There is a soundtrack that is playing behind the scenes of your life. The soundtrack of your life expresses what you think about who God is, what your view of whether God is with you or not. There is a soundtrack that is playing constantly in your life, particularly in transitionary windows as you reflect back in order to look forward. And so what I want to ask you today is this very simple question. Is the song you're choosing to sing a song of praise or a song of lament? Is the song that you're choosing to sing a song that honors God for who He is or a song of complaint for what you think He hasn't done for you in this last year? Is the song you're choosing to sing a song that lifts Him up for His person, for His character, for His sovereignty, or is it a song that whinges about all the things that should have happened to you? A week out from Christmas, exactly a week, seven days before Christmas, I had one of those days in the office. In fact, it was one of those weeks in the office. In fact, in context, it was actually one of those years in my life where I'd reflected on, on the many things that I had probably summed in my own head had not happened according to expectation. I felt let down. I felt disappointed. I felt I actually hit a bit of a mild depression that day. I, in fact, came home and had a complete meltdown, and I vented over Chrissy. 
poor darling. Can you give my wife a big hand because she puts up with so much? I just came home that day and I just melted down before her on the couch, right? And, and, and I, just, I just hit this wall and I just talked about, I just, I just wanted to punch someone in the head. I wanted to sack somebody, starting with myself. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to do stuff to just, you know, I just wanted to crawl into a hole and curl up in a fetal position and sing the song, What About Me? It is, in fact, the Shannon Knoll version, not the moving pictures version, because the Shannon Knoll version is so much worse. I just wanted to sing it. I just wanted to crawl into a hole and stay in the hole and play that Shannon Knoll song over and over again on constant repeat, repeat the chorus, repeat the last line. But no matter how much I wanted to do that, it actually didn't help me. Got to the end of the night, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. I just said to Chrissy, Chrissy, I can't even pray myself clear. I'm in such a funk. Will you pray with me? And as she began to pray with me, I just felt something lift off me. The next day, the next day in the office, the Lord led me to this passage in Habakkuk, and the Holy Spirit actually literally said this to me. You're going to preach this on the last Sunday of the year to the church, and even though there's not going to be many people at church, there's a lot of people at church, but even though, at the time, even though there's not many people at church, this sermon is going to go viral because people need to hear this truth, right? And the Holy Spirit actually spoke to me about this, and He said this, there is a song that is woeful and mournful in, the, in a minor key with violins and everything playing in the background, but the Holy Spirit said this, you are completely in charge of the playlist of your life. He said, you get to choose your own playlist. You've just been choosing the wrong songs to soundtrack your life. You get to choose the playlist. How many of you know that God has given you the power to choose the playlist of your life? When you come to church, you gotta, you got you to sing the songs the worship leader has chosen. you got no choice in that, right? But you get to choose the playlist of your life, the song of your heart that you sing along to in the everyday of your life, Habakkuk was teaching the nation of Israel this very truth, that even though there are all these things that have happened that have been adverse to our circumstance this season, I am choosing to lodge this particular chorus and stanza with a choir director because they're going to put song to it and we're all going to sing the song of hope. And when you choose to sing praise like Habakkuk did, you're not denying that the fig tree has not been blossoming for you or that there's been no fruit on the vine. You're not denying that though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food for you. You're not denying that though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls. What you're saying is that I don't deny what's happened and yet I choose to exalt the one who is my salvation, who is my victory, who is my source of strength. Come on, who is my shelter? We're choosing to praise. Can I go a little deeper with you? What Habakkuk was essentially teaching the nation of Israel coming out of a whole season, three, four generations of being under Babylonian rule, was how to rightly divide truths. Habakkuk chapter 3, the closing chapter of the book of Habakkuk. Let's have a look at what we just read. The first stanza, come on, keep up with me, media. Habakkuk 3 verse 17 says, Though the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, that is a lesser truth. The greater truth is this, keep up with me. Yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation because the greater truth is that I have a victorious God of my salvation. The greater truth is that the Lord God is my strength. The greater truth is that He's the source of my, come on, I need a resounding amen. He is my invincible army. He has made my feet steady because every single person, if you're here and you are reflective like me, you look backwards in order to look forwards, you are likely to be living in the parallel of truths. You've always got stuff going on that is not ideal, but you've always got another truth, which is the sovereignty of God at work in your life. What Habakkuk is teaching us is that in every transitionary window, we ought to know how to divide what is a lesser truth with a greater truth. There are some things that are happening in your life right now, and maybe even in the year that you've had, you need to box that in the lesser truth pile and start singing about the greater truth. Because if there's anything that the devil wants to do to you in this particular season in your life is bring to you truth confusion. He wants you to confuse your lesser truth for the greater truth and confuse your greater truth for the lesser truth because guarantee 
100%, your lesser truths in any point in your life will always feel more real to you in the moment than the greater truths. In any point in your life, that sickness, that redundancy, that heartbreak from that broken relationship, that that house that didn't sell, that business deal that didn't come through, that, 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 that symptom or that condition that's in your body, it's always going to feel more real to you in the moment than the fact that Jesus is your shelter, He's your hiding place, He's your Prince of Peace. That lesser truth will always feel more real to you than the greater truth. But what Habakkuk teaches us is that every believer has the power to rightly divide what is a lesser truth and start to choose the song that glorifies the greater truth. Have I got a church with me tonight? Come on, are you out there? And so maybe in 2019, the fig tree did not blossom for you in your life, in whatever way that looked. Maybe stuff just didn't happen for you, but you need to know that God is your salvation. Sing about that. Maybe there's been no fruit on the vines for you. Maybe you've ground out a year of really hard work and there's been nothing to show for it. But you need to understand the greater truth is that the Lord God is your strength and source of your courage and an invisible army. Sing about that. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't even know why you're at church at a 5 p.m. service somewhere in the southern suburbs of Perth. But I want to submit to you that Habakkuk is actually teaching every believer a key secret, and I want to share this with you because it's actually going to last you in the coming decade. This is going to be life-changing for you as it was for me. It's, it, it's essentially this. If I could sum up one, in one sentence what the book of Habakkuk is about, it's simply this, that God's people, every believer, can choose to praise in the face of disappointment. If you don't know God, that is a very hard thing. But if you know Jesus in this place, if God is real to you, you can actually choose to praise in the face of disappointment. How many of you have experienced disappointment this year? How many of you have had a disappointment-free year or a disappointment-free decade? Put your hand up. I didn't think so. And nobody. If you're here today and you've had a disappointment-free year, get out of here right now because I don't want to talk to you. But we've all understood what it's like to be let down, to, to, to have had things not turn out the way that we expected, even promises from God that have remained unfulfilled. See, what disappointment is, and I don't have time to preach that today. I'm going to run out of time. I might do something in the latter part of the year. But what disappointment actually does to the human soul is that it causes a deep emotional pain. What disappointment does to the human soul is it, it, not just an event that didn't happen as we expected it to, it to What disappointment does to the human soul is that it actually causes a deep emotional pain. For something that we think should have happened to not happen, or for something unexpected that that happened to us that is disappointing, it often causes a deep emotional pain. And the Bible actually tells us and shows us that praise is the only way that the pain of your disappointment can be healed. How do we know this? Case studies all over the Word of God with this. We see David, who was anointed to be king, and yet he was chased like an animal in a cave. Read the book of Psalms. What did he do to heal the pain of that disappointment? He praised. Joseph, who was anointed to be governor of the nation of Egypt, finds himself in jail, accused of rape that he didn't commit. What does he do to heal the pain of disappointment? He praises. Paul and Silas should have planted a church in Philippi, yet they find themselves in jail. Come on, are you out there? With feet, in their, with feet and stocks in their necks chained to a wall. And what do they do to heal the pain of disappointment? They praise. Habakkuk was teaching an entire nation who for three generations had been living under Babylonian rule, that the way to heal the pain of your disappointment is to praise. And this is what I know through all the years of leading people and journeying with worship and praise myself is this. Praise literally opens the door for Jesus to walk in and heal you from that pain of disappointment. And so this is what you need to catch. The greater the unmet expectations and the greater the challenge and the trial and the pain of disappointment is that you've experienced as you've reflected back on your year, the higher your praise needs to go. Come on, are you out there? Because for so many of us, we praise momentarily. We kind of open the door and shut it again. The deeper the pain of disappointment for the year that's gone, we need to praise longer and harder. Hold that door open. Come on, are you out there? So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, every single available angel can come in and heal you of your disappointment. Praise does something to the human soul that Habakkuk was teaching is incredibly 
powerful. Ultimately, what Habakkuk was discipling an entire nation to do was to transition out of immaturity into maturity. Because maturity is always marked by shifting from circumstantial praise to conviction praise. Maturity is always, maturity in every believer is always marked, particularly in transitionary windows like the week we're in, as we look back and looking forward. Maturity is always marked by transitioning from circumstantial praise to conviction praise. Circumstantial praise says this, if things are going good, I'm going to praise you, but if they're not going good, I'm going to keep my mouth shut or even vent and complain and curl up and sing, what about me? It isn't fair. But conviction praise says that though the fig tree tree withers, though the fields produce no food, yet I will praise you. For you are, come on, are you out there? Because we don't, your circumstances are too shaky for you to hitch your praise on. The world doesn't need a church that praises one day, curses the next. Come on, are you out there? The world doesn't need to see a church up and down. We praise hallelujah one day because you don't need, you don't need a revelation to praise when things are going your way. That's not a revelation, that's a reaction. You know how when your footy team wins, yeah, woo! It's just a reaction. You don't need a revelation for it. What you need is during times where your fig tree does not blossom, when your fields do not produce food, when there are no cattle in the stalls, that you transition from circumstantial praise where you only praise when things are going good to step into maturity, that I'm going to praise out of conviction. And I know that there is a pain of disappointment that I'm carrying right now, but I'm going to praise. And the deeper the disappointment, the higher my praise. I'm going to open that door so, Jesus, you can walk in out of my pain to heal me right now. For so many of us, the song in our heart has not just great effect over the atmosphere of our lives, but it has profound effect for the atmosphere of the people around us. We just reflected on Christmas, and we've just had Christmas. Have you had a good Christmas? The hero of the entire Christmas account outside of, the, of Jesus himself obviously coming into the world, but the hero of that early part of the nativity account was actually a young girl by the name of Mary. Mary was a teenage girl whom God gave a tiny little assignment for. God said to her, Mary, you're a young girl. I would like to give you a small job. You're going to carry and birth the Savior of the world into the earth. I don't know if you've ever thought about Mary, but she's a 16-year-old girl, 15-year-old girl maybe. And being a teenage girl, she would have had dreams about how her life would turn out. But Mary did not have the fairy tale life. Come on. I don't know about you, but this could, this could be stereotyping 16-year-old girls, but you dream about the fairy tale life. You know what I'm saying? When you're a teenage girl, you, 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 you dream about, you know, one day, maybe at the perfect age of 21, meeting the perfect guy. And that perfect guy would ask you out, right? And then, and then, and then you would make, that, would make that social media official. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then like uh, exactly about 18 months later at about 22 and a half years old, um, he would conspire to propose to you and he would get all his friends and, and you know, he would be in an outdoor setting with hanging lights and, and, and pallets and like cushions and little signs that says, will you marry me? And that, that little social media shot. You know what I'm saying? And you make that official, right? And then, and then in, in your perfect world, then, then exactly about 12 months later, uh, you would have the wedding day, hashtag and everything. It was beautiful. And then you post it on social media. And then in, in exactly about three and a half years time after that, you would try for a child. And you would have uh, the pregnancy straight away and all be really smooth. And then you would have that Facebook official thing as well, right? And then, and then about three months later, you would have the gender reveal party, with pink or, or blue balloon. And you put that on social media as well, right? You know what I'm saying? Then you have the baby and then that's on social media as well. Mary didn't have that. (laughs) She was a teenage girl that was not married and had to hide her pregnancy. God made her pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. She was carrying Jesus at a time where the Roman Empire wanted to kill off any suggestion of a rival or rising kingdom that would be a threat to the Roman Empire. She had to carry Jesus with her life in danger. I don't know about you, but if I was married, thank God I'm not. I would have sung, what about me? It isn't fair. But the Bible says in Luke chapter 1 that Mary had a different song. If you asked Mary the question, what song are you singing? She wouldn't have had a song of complaint and lament. She actually had a song of praise. In Luke chapter 1, it accounts for when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant, but with John the Baptist. 
And the Bible says that when the two of them met, the baby inside Elizabeth leapt because of the song that Mary carried in her heart. Mary could have whinged and complained and gone to her cousin's house and vented. But when the Bible says that when she walked into the room, the baby, the destiny that was inside Elizabeth leapt. I want to ask you the question today and, and, and say, this, say, say this to you. The, the song of your heart will either lift someone else's faith or rob their faith from them. What does the song of your heart do to the person sitting next to you? What does the song of your heart, the song that you're choosing to sing, do to the atmosphere in your marriage? What does the song, what does the soundtrack of your life do to the atmosphere in your house? Come on, are you out there? See, what you don't know is that Elizabeth was an older cousin of Mary's, and, and her and her husband, Zachariah, had been infertile, unable to have kids. God speaks to Zachariah about your wife, you guys conceiving of a child, and Zachariah, because of years of undealt with disappointment, actually scoffed at God. God saying, are you going to conceive of a child? He's going to be John the Baptist. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And Zechariah said, <laughs> tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. Tell me lies. Some of you are too young. What song is that? Fleetwood Mac. I'm going to go on this side. Much, much more older people. To which... God said, if that's going to be the soundtrack of your life, I want to press the mute button. God made Zechariah mute. God said to Zechariah, if you're not going to change the playlist of your life, I don't want what's on you to kill off what your wife is carrying. And I'm going to press mute. Mary, I'm going to send you to Elizabeth. I want to submit to you today, choose in this coming decade to be a Mary to somebody and not a Zechariah. Come on. The world doesn't need more Zacharias walking around. The world needs more Marys. Does the song in your heart cause someone else's destiny to come alive? Does the song, the soundtrack of your life when you walk into your home, does it cause your kid's faith to lift? The song of your heart, when you walk in, does it cause your spouse to believe again that God can actually do something in you? Come on, are you out there? I want to be part of a church that is not the Zacharias to our community that, oh, you know, really? Oh, that's not really a miracle. That Matt Catterall thing, that was just all a little bit fake. I want it to be, I want us to be the voice of Mary. When Mary could have sung a song of lament, the Bible says here in Luke chapter 1, your English translation Bible would have the title, The Song of Mary. She could have said, what about me? It isn't fair. I'm just a teenage girl. I don't get the fairy tale. She says this, my soul magnifies the Lord. Keep up with me. It should be on there. <laughs> and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Next slide. <laughs> just ignore the slide. And says, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. Isn't that awesome? What great maturity. If you keep reading that whole passage of Scripture, it is an entire song of a girl that should have had a song of lament. I don't know about you, but on this side of the decade, I am determining that the song of my heart it's going to be a song of praise because that's what our community needs to hear. That's what our city needs. Let the song of praise awaken in this church for 2020. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? <laughs> Musicians, you can join me. Come on, would you stand to your feet right across this room? Musicians, you can join me. I'm running out of time. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a second? If I may just ask you to consider the state of your heart tonight on this final service of the year. If you've never experienced God for yourself, you've never experienced Jesus as real to you, or maybe for this last little while, you felt estranged or distant from God. You've walked away from Him. You've walked, you've, you've, veered away from Him in your heart. Tonight, I want to give you an opportunity on this side of the new year to change that. 
you can make a decision tonight that doesn't require any religious work, just an open heart to simply say, God, I invite you into my life. I don't want to do this life on my own anymore. But right now in this place, I invite you, Jesus, to forgive me of all that I've done and to welcome me into the family of faith. Maybe you've been trying to do your life in your own strength, trying to figure it out, and it's not working for you. And you're stubborn because you think that you can do it on your own. I want to say this to you. Let Jesus into your life tonight. Maybe there are certain things that have happened in your life that cause you at these sorts of moments of decision to just not be able to take that step. But I want to challenge your heart one more time to say yes and open up your heart to the greatest gift you will ever receive, which is Jesus. To wipe away all the things that you've done and give you a brand new start. To be assured of where you'll be tonight should your life end. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you today, if you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to come back to the family of faith, all you need to do is slip your hand up so I can see who you are. God loves you so much. It's such a safe place to make this decision so many people have. They can all attest to what Jesus has done for them and tonight could be your night too. I'm going to count to three if that's you. All you need to do is lift your hand. One, two, three. Three. Just put your hand up so I can see who you are. Awesome, I see that hand over there. Anybody else? Quickly, just put your hand up so I can see who you are. You want to come back to the family of God? Is that you? Come on, is that you? Anybody else? God loves you so much. You're so worth waiting for. You're so worth waiting for. Is that you tonight? Quickly, just give me a wave if that's you. I want to lead you in prayer. I want to lead you in prayer. Is that you tonight? Maybe you feel far from God, but tonight you want to Say a prayer that brings you back in the family of God. Is that you tonight? Quickly just shoot your hand up so I can see who you are. I see another hand over there. Awesome, wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else? Come on, this is a safe place because we're a church family. Let's say this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died and you rose again for me. Lord Jesus, I repent of every wrong thing that I've done, and I ask you to forgive me and give me a brand new future in you. Lord Jesus, tonight I invite you into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. So good. God loves you so much, young lady. God loves you so much. We've seen your hand, and leaders have seen your hand. You know, at the end of tonight, they're going to come to you, give you a Bible, pray with you, talk with you about the prayer that you've just prayed. But for everybody else, would you just bow your heads? God wants to do some business with you in this final service of the year. If you're here tonight, And as I've been speaking, God has actually been speaking to you like He did to me a week out from Christmas. Maybe you need to change the soundtrack of your life. You need to change the songs you've been singing along to. Maybe some of you, you're feeling challenged to move from a place of circumstantial praise to a place of conviction praise. If that's you, begin to lift your hands right where you're standing. God is changing the soundtrack of your life. Just lift your hands. Others here, others here. As you reflect back on 2019 and even the last two, three years that have passed you by, there have been deep disappointments that have caused you pain. And no matter how you try and think that it's cathartic just to vent, just to offload at somebody, it actually hasn't healed the pain of that disappointment. It might have been a band-aid on the issue But you know that praise is the only thing that can open the door for Jesus to come in and heal the pain of that disappointment. Begin to lift your hands if that's you. You've had a a year. Some of you have walked through hell and back. Some of you have transitioned out of churches. You've transitioned out of different family situations. It's been so difficult, more than people even know. And yet you've carried this pain. 
And there have been times where it's been so difficult to even worship, to even praise. And I want to say this to you. That is the time where you need to praise all the more. The deeper your disappointment, the higher your praise needs to go. And if that applies to any of you tonight, I want you to make a very bold move tonight and begin to worship right out the front here with me. Come on, step out of your seat. Every person here is saying, yeah, that's me. I'm going to change the soundtrack of my life. I'm moving from circumstantial praise to conviction praise, or I'm going to open the door for Jesus to come and heal me in that pain of disappointment of the kind of year that I've had. Come on, if that's you, come.